Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another fan request review for you. This time I'm going to be reviewing the first two episodes of the show Exo Squad, as requested by viewer Danger Mouse. And these episodes are called, respectively, Pirate Scourge and Seeds of Deception. Uh, anyway, let's uh, dive right into it. Um, this is going to be a little... This is actually going to be a little bit difficult review for me to do, uh, simply because there's a lot, and I mean a lot, going on in these first two episodes. So rather than really delve very heavily into the plot, I'm just going to give you the very the very basics of the world, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, the, what's going on in this world after that. So the basic uh, idea is that it's um, a good bit into the future, and for a while there was basically... You know, peace on Earth, everybody was prosperous and well-fed, there was no war. Uh, but the downside to this society was that they were using a genetically engineered humanoids called Neo-Sapiens. Yeah, sci-fi, what are you going to do, huh? Uh, basically, essentially as slave labor on Mars, which was able to help supply the Earth with everything it needed to be this paradise. Well, uh, not surprisingly, the Neo Sapiens didn't much like being treated that way, so they rebel. There was this big rebellion. Lots of people died. Ultimately, the humans were able to put the rebellion down, and amazingly enough, started working with the Neo Sapiens. There's and now in the future, you know, time has passed. Fifty years have passed since that happened. There are Neo Sapiens in the government. There is a strong willingness among some. And I emphasize some of the humans to put the hat past behind us. Let's embrace the Neo Sapiens as our equals. Let's be friends, and all that. However, the galaxy is the um, solar system galaxy, whatever, is still a very turbulent and uh, at times unsteady place. And what happens very early on is that a pirate attack sparks um, basically what looks like it could be the beginning of a whole brand new system-wide war. And there's obviously a lot, lot more to it than that, but that's the basics that you have to understand for the world that we're going in here. And the other uh, big thing that you have to understand is that, of course, they have of course they have space travel. There are spaceships and uh, you know fighters and all this other stuff. But the other big one are that they have in this world is a technology called exoframes and these are honestly basically like power suits equipped with guns and missiles that can function and fight in the vacuum of space and uh, as you can probably guess by the name of this show our main focus is on a group of exoframe pilots who are members of the earth military who are called able squad now there's a lot of these guys there's actually quite a few members of the squad and honestly, to be perfectly honest, it, unless I were to go and look at the Wikipedia page for the series, I would really not be able to give you the names of all of them. I know there's like Weston and JT and um, Bronski and Takagi and a couple of other guys. But anyway, um, <clears throat> let, let's get into what, this world a little bit more. First of all, and again, I have looked at the Wikipedia page. So I understand a little bit more in detail of this world than just what I've seen in these first two episodes. But as I do around here, I'm just going to be talking about what it is that I see in these first two episodes. And uh, one of the first things that I see, and I believe this was mentioned on the entry in Wikipedia, is that the uh, classic Japanese uh, mech series, the, really the show that sort of took giant robots and really brought them down to something that really seemed like it could fit into reasonable science fiction it was of course the series from 1979 Mobile Suit Gundam and you can definitely see the uh, the influence of Gundam on this show if you're also a fan of uh, mech shows like I am you can probably see quite a bit of influence from shows like uh, Macross aka here in the US Robotech and let, let, let's not get into a lot of stuff about the controversies surrounding Robotech, all right? Uh, I have seen all of Robotech, all three series, and, you know, for whatever issues it might have in regards to what was going on with the, Jap the original Japanese versions, I actually think it's a really good show. 
and I really would consider Exo Squad to be a very worthy successor to that show in terms of uh, you. It, it, it's it originating in the United States, kind of with Ma Cross, but definitely with uh, Exo Squad. But anyway, the thing here is that barring a few, I don't, I don't want to exactly say fantastic elements. I want to say. I guess maybe soft science fiction is the closest thing that I can come to. But but what I'm trying to say here is that one thing that I like about the Exo Squad universe is that with the exception of the Exo Frames and the Neo Sapiens, it really does feel very much like a, a hard sci-fi universe. This is something where you can see the influence of things like Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers and other more grounded and I know that's an unusual term to use, more grounded science fiction. You could see, like, um, for example, the modern Battlestar Galactica. Well, you had the Cylons, of course, and you know they're pretty crazy and out there in terms of what is realistically possible. But on the other hand, a lot of the way the, the Battlestar itself operated, the way the pilots handled things, the way they interacted with each other, the way they followed military protocol, and in general, the Cylons apart, the way technology worked, was reasonably well, solidly rooted in actual technology. Now, we do, and I feel that Exo Squad is something that kind of continues on. This is a future that feels plausible. It is a future that does, of course, have some fantastic elements. Oh, there I go, using the word fantastic. Okay, we're just going to stick with that term, such as the Neo Sapiens being this genetically engineered race. And you can even, and even applying that to the exoframes is a little bit of a stretch, as you know, recent advances in modern technology seem to be saying that stuff like the exoframes are in fact a real possibility. You know, not today, not tomorrow, maybe not even ten years from now, but in a hundred years, it certainly is believable. So I will give the show um, quite a bit of credit for choosing to go the road less traveled in American animated sci-fi shows and keep things on a fairly grounded, hard science fiction level. Um, another thing that I was also very surprised by the show and genuinely quite impressed by was that this is a very, this is a very gritty show. It is a show that originally aired in 1993 and to, let me provide you with a little bit of context as to what was going on in animation in the early to mid-90s. Uh, one of the best examples I can give you is the 90s Spider-Man cartoon, very much beloved by Spider-Man fans, superhero fans, animation fans. On that show, they could not do things like, say, die or even show blood, e even in an episode that dealt with Morbius the Living Vampire. They could not actually say the word blood on TV. Orbius in that particular incarnation had to feed on plasma. You know, because actually hearing the word blood was somehow going to horribly, horribly traumatize the children of the 90s. And perhaps the most egregious example was there was a few times when the police would, on that show were trying to arrest Spider-Man and shot at him. But... Even though this series was set in 1990s New York, because of the rules of television at that time, the police could not actually have bullets come out of their gun. Somehow, little blue lasers were being fired at Spider-Man by the NYPD. The NYPD of the 1990s. So, and... As I, if I'm if I'm keeping my dates correctly, this is actually going to have happened several years after Exo Squad went off the air. So again, dialing it back to what was going on in 1993, 1994. Excuse me a second. Oh man, sorry about that, everybody. Hope that uh, didn't blow your ears out. But anyway, um, the, just the fact that they are willing to do um, some of the things that we see in the show, for example. People die in this show. I mean, it's not done in, in a very graphic way, but they don't gloss over the fact that people die. People are die, people die in the show. People are shot. I mean, they don't show 
anyone being shot. They do show people being injured, and we're later told see you're given a scene where someone is taking their pulse and just basically says, like, no, they they didn't make it. And we also see when um, the the guys in Able Squad go to try and rescue some people from a ship that has been attacked by pirates. They go to lift the debris off this one fellow who's still alive and has been horribly injured, and basically set off an IED. Now keep in mind, folks, Now this was not too long after the original Gulf War, but IEDs really didn't kind of get into the public imagination, the public, the public sphere of that much, until the more the recent Iraqi invasion, which happened 10 years later. So just the fact that they were willing to do these sort of things on what is, you know, basically a kid show shows what to me at the time was really just a very unprecedented willingness to go to a very dark place. Um, and just to give you another slightly less grim example, uh, when that um, the pirate ugh, that ship that was attacked by the pirates, before that happens, we are actually get to spend a little bit of time with the captain and one of the guys on the ship, just sort of you know talking about stuff, complaining, blah blah blah, going around life. And there's this one guy he's fooling around with a hologram of a dancing girl, and if you read between the lines, this is basically as close as they could get to having a guy just chilling out looking at porn on 90 Saturday morning TV. Again, just the fact that they could do anything that even implies something like that is exactly really just just mind-blowing to me, from especially given what I remember of TV in the 90s, especially uh, animated programs. So um, let's uh, kind of get into another one of the show's uh, strong points, and it's that they're willing to give their characters some genuinely reasonable and realistic flaws. Uh, there's this one fella. He is extremely just flat-out racist towards Neo-Sapiens. He actually ends up saving the life of a very important Neo-Sapien politician, and when the politician comes to th thank him and shake his hand, he flat-out refuses and tells the guy to his face, I I don't like your people. And this the fellow in question was a police officer, and he just says to him, I only saved your life because it is my job. And, well, the look, now remember, folks, Racism is, of course, naturally a very hot-button issue today, and it was certainly just as true in the 1990s, perhaps in some ways even more so, because in the 90s, this was a time when if you were to actually say, for example, black instead of African-American when you're referring to a person of that ethnicity, there are people who would literally start calling you a racist on the spot. There are even people like that today who still do that. But thankfully, I think we've uh, learned to tone it down a little bit. Also, partially, partially, I like to think due to the fact that not everybody in the world is black, who is black is from America. I know of I've seen more than a few people on the internet rolling their eyes at uh, people referring to uh, black folks from the UK as African Americans. But anyway, we're going off on a completely different uh, track. So anyway, another thing that we see is one of the uh, characters writing letters home to her family. And what we see her doing this is she's genuinely making out, I'm sorry, making her extraordinarily dangerous job, the, a job that she could very easily die doing, out to just sort of seem, you know, very basic, very unglamorous, very quote-unquote safe military work. And... That's something that just emotionally rings very true to me. Naturally, people who are in risky positions, especially during wartime, are going to want to allay their loved ones' fears and concerns for their safety. And remember, I'm saying this as somebody who's got two members of my family who are active duty military personnel. Okay, my cousin and uh, my stepbrother-in-law. And my stepbrother-in-law is a guy who has actually survived an IED going off near him in Iraq. So, yeah, I, I understand what this can do. What someone you care about being in those sort of situations can put on a family. 
So, as I said, I think that's something that emotionally rings very true. And it's it's such a simple touch to the characters and to the story that's going on. But it's one that brings an incredible amount of, of humanity here. Now, another thing that I um, also like is that for a show that does contain these these sci-fi elements, especially some of the more fantastic stuff like the Neo Sapiens, dialogue in this show is handled incredibly, incredibly realistic. And the portrayal by the actors is that of people who there there there's no nudge nudge wink wink to the audience. There's no you know, hey, I'm playing a cartoon character and wow, look at all this crazy stuff that's happening around me. No, it's all very realistic. It feels like real conversations that people have, whether they're joking around and just sort of giving each other a little a friendly hard time, or if there's a very serious crisis going on, it at all times it feels like honestly, it just simply feels realistic. Just hearing the way these things are phrased, the way things are taken seriously, it just really adds a very impressive amount of depth to what's going on around me, around this, around the characters in this world, and it really helps this feel more like a real, a real place, a real world inhabited by the kind of people that you and I interact with every day. So, and, um, you know, actually continuing on talking about uh, some of the strong points of this episode, so, uh, one thing that I was actually slightly surprised to see is that they also take time to sort of comment about the role of the media. There's this sort of annoying investigative reporter hanging around the military trying to do his story, but he keeps slanting things in ways that just, frankly, make people who are just trying to do their jobs look bad. And he's obviously doing this for his own gain. It honestly, uh, well, you know what? I don't think I want to get get into anything that political. So let's uh, leave it at that. So, as I said, there's a lot going on here. Uh, the political ramifications of this escalating conflict are actually incredibly, incredibly well done. You can see, you know, good good guys do this, the bad guys do this. There's move. There's counter move. There's obviously a lot of planning going on behind the scenes for these characters. There's political maneuvering, there's ambushes, there's traps. Like I said, just a lot is going on in this show. And, you know, I have to give an incredible amount of credit to the folks who are doing the writing here. This really does feel like something that if they'd had the budget and the technology to do it right in 1993, this is something that really could have been on par with just any science fiction show. I mean, I know I've already invoked the modern Battlestar Galactica once before, but if I were to compare it to anything else on recent TV, that's the show that this reminds me of. If Imagine if you were to take elements from the modern Battlestar Galactica and just kick it up another notch or two, you'd be about in the ballpark of what we're dealing with with ExoSquad here. Uh, now, let me talk about the show's one very, very major flaw. And as I've said, this show originates from 1993. Now, folks, I remember 1993 reasonably well. And it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And as a guy who was reading comic books at the time, there was a fellow, if you're not familiar with comic books, there's a fellow, guy who was, at the time was very, very famous, a uh, fellow by the name of Rob Liefeld, came out of Marvel Comics. He's actually the co-creator of the very popular character Deadpool. If you've ever seen uh, any stuff like him, like the Marvel vs. Capcom 3, or um, so the uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliances, or anything like that. But anyway, uh, Rob was a very influential artist uh, er during the very early 90s, the early days of Image Comics, and he ultimately became very well known for his uh, 
unique style of character designs, which was very big on uh, you know, skin tight body suits and shoulder pads and a ridiculous number of belts and pouches. And f honestly, folks, whoever was doing the art for this series was obviously a very big Rob Liefeld fan because you cannot look at the characters and the outfits in Exo Squad and not see the fingerprints of Rob Liefeld's influence all over them. And during, of course, the latter part of the 90s, after... Um, I, I, I really hesitate to use the term heyday because Rob Liefeld's still around, still doing things, but Liefeld became honestly almost reviled by many comic fans simply because there were so many people who imitated his style and in doing so put out a lot of stuff that was really subpar. And I don't really think that, that and I'll be frankly, I'll be frank and admit that I was, was one of those people, but more time having passed, I've realized you can't blame an original for the imitators. Now, though, granted, Rob is a guy who, like all artists, has his strengths and he has his cons, but I, I really can't blame the guy for be being popular or for people who chose to imitate his style. But I can sort of lay a little blame to him on him on just how incredibly impractical and you know, unrealistic these outfits are. And keep in mind, the, a lot of the folks that are wearing these are members of Able Squad, who are ostensibly members of the military. And just the idea that the military would let people walk around in these outfits is just absolutely laughable. And that's in addition to th doing things like, you know, letting the female members have ponytails that go almost all the way down to their butts. So, yeah, the, one of the huge flaws of this show is that it looks, and I mean it looks painfully like something from the early 90s. Now, I, I, I kind of, I realize that it is somewhat unfair to hold that against a show. I mean, I can't, it would be unfair of me to blame to criticize a movie from the 1970s for looking like a movie from the 1970s. But, and here's my but. Okay, that unintentionally sounded dirty, and I apologize. This was a science fiction show. It is meant to be set in the future. And to so deliberately invoke something, the style of the 90s, and something that is set... A, very far, reasonably far into the future. That's really just a bad decision. Uh, one of the the uh, great quibbles that I have with uh, Shadowrun is just how much a lot of it seems to look like stuff from the 80s. But anyway, you know. Well, that's I guess I should say that's old school Shadowrun. So again, I guess my my comment there also applies. So yeah, the big flaw of Exo Squad is that the creators just um, they kept the future looking a little bit impractical and extremely contemporary at, at least in terms of the comics uh, now I'm going to have to actually do a little bit of a departure from what I normally do here in terms of talking about the characters because as I said honestly I haven't nailed everybody's name down now, granted, I could go kind of look at the at Wikipedia and just sort of read read my thoughts about these characters to you off my notes, but I'm I'm not going to do that simply because I I don't think that two episodes is really a fair amount of time to give any of these characters a real good shake. Now, I grant I'll grant you they do have little moments. Uh, Bronski is a character who in these episodes is actually uh, pretty well fleshed out. I ended up uh, liking him quite a bit. Uh, also, we get, get, get a fairly decent read on the leader of Able Squad, JT, but there's so many other characters going around that in order to do them justice, I think I would have to see more. And here, so much is is by necessity of storytelling, dedicated to setting up the world that these characters live in, that sadly the characterization aspect of things 
gets pushed to the side. Now, from what I understand, this is genuinely remedied as the series wears on, but again, I'm focusing on just what I see in these first two episodes. So anyway, let's uh, wrap this up here. Overall, Exo Squad is really, it's really a diamond in the rough. I was genuinely extremely impressed by the level of storytelling that the show has. And considering that it comes from a very conservative time of animation on American TV, the fact that the folks that made the show were willing to go down the road they did and really, really push the envelope the way they did is an accomplishment that really does have to be applauded. Now, granted, the show definitely does show its age. I've talked about that in terms of the character designs, and uh, honestly, in terms of production values, it hasn't aged very well either. But if you if you can kind of look past that and just focus in on the story of what's going on, then I would consider Exo Squad to be, as I've said, a real diamond in the rough. This is a show that really does look like it could, it, it is, it is a winner. I'll even say that just based on these first two episodes, and I, I'm genuinely intrigued to see more. Just that, just to see what could have been if this show had really found the audience that it needed. I think it could have been an extraordinarily important influence on American animation of the time. So anyway, overall, if you if you just like good, well-written animation, if you like science fiction, if you like mech stuff, give this show a try. You might be pleasantly surprised, just like I would. Uh, anyway, as always, uh, take care and have a good one. And of course, comment, rate, subscribe. And you can follow me on Twitter at as Hoosier Jedi. Until next time, folks, take care.